Welcome to Clear Creek Community Church Online. We exist to lead unchurched people to become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. We are a people, not a place, and are sent to make a difference in our world. Clear Creek gathers for worship online and across multiple campuses in the Bay Area of Houston. For more information, visit us at clearcreek.org. Welcome, and thanks for engaging with us online today. If it's your first time connecting with Clear Creek, we hope it won't be your last. In fact, we'd love to know that you're watching and worshiping with us today. We really believe that church isn't just a service that you attend or watch online. The church is a people that you connect with and grow with. And so, you can let us know that you're engaging with us today by going to clearcreek.org, click on the I'm New button, or you can send us a direct message on any of our social platforms. We would love to connect with you. If Clear Creek is your church home and you want to know what's going on this week, go to clearcreek.org. You can give online, subscribe to our communication loop, or check out any classes or events coming up in this season. But today, we gather online to worship, to hear from God and to respond to Him. So let's worship together. You know, we as the church gather not only um, in physical locations around the Bay Area, but wherever you are, you are also a part of the church today. So we invite you to worship together with us right now. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the world's I have made and I see the stars I hear the rolling thunder thy power throughout the universe display then sings my soul my Savior God to thee how great My soul, my Savior, God, to Thee, how great Thou art, how great.
kiss But your light is greater You light our way God, you light our way When evil is rising You're rising higher With power to save With power to save ago, I was really at a point where I was trying to figure out exactly where was the best fit for me to serve in the church. I just couldn't find a place. And so I was already in a meeting with someone on staff here at church. And I said, if you ever think about this, just let me know. And they said, well, let's do it right now. So they made me list everything on the board in their office, you know, my gifts, my experience, you know, what I cared about. And as we're talking, they said, you know, there is this new ministry we have, and we really might need someone who looks at everything that comes in the door, all the content that we're producing. And I was thinking at the time, like, I, I hope this isn't real because it sounds like the worst thing ever. This sounds boring. This sounds like organization, which is not my gift set. Surely we're not talking about the right thing. So I smiled and I nodded, and then I hoped that was the end of it. So a couple days later, I get an email from Ryan Leighton. And he said, I heard you want to volunteer. Do you have time to come in and talk to me? So I did. And Ryan told me about this ministry that our church was really just starting to develop. And the goal was to just continue the conversation of faith beyond Sunday service to where it affects our whole lives. And that was going to be through podcasts and articles and stories and lots of ways. And he needed someone to just help kick it off, to help get us going in this ministry. And I was still really unsure about what this was gonna look like and if I was really equipped, but I had recently made a promise that if God opened a door in my life, that I was gonna walk through it. 
Even if I didn't feel equipped, even if I wasn't sure about it, I was gonna trust God and walk through the door that he opened. I started writing some articles. Ryan convinced me to host a podcast. I tried to find other people who could use their gifts for the benefit of Clear Creek Resources too. And it took a lot of second starts and humility and patience. It wasn't immediate, but it was soon clear that God had always known where he was leading me. It turns out that everything in my life, God's, God's faithfulness in my life had really led me to this particular ministry. How he had wired me, my past experience, even my education had, had really been a gift that I could give to the church through this type of service. It's everything that I was passionate about, collaboration, diversity, deep faith in the church. And God had used all of it to lead me to this place. So I'm just grateful to be a part of this ministry, and I'm just thankful that God is using me in a small way for His kingdom. Well, Rachel's story is just one of many around Clear Creek. You see, when we utilize the gifts God's given us to serve His church, we grow, the church is encouraged, and more and more people have the opportunity to hear the gospel. Clear Creek Resources, the, the ministry Rachel began serving in, all of that began as our desire to resource you and to equip you as followers of Jesus to continue the conversation. We want you to continue that conversation beyond just a weekly worship service. Now, the other thing is it's also a place to start the conversation. Think about it. Everyone we want to reach with the gospel is probably online. And we want to provide content in a way where we can start a conversation about faith and so we have videos and podcasts with that audience in mind. So check out Clear Creek Resources this week. Like it, share it, and send resources to your friends. Well, today we continue our series called United. And in that, we're focusing on the importance of keeping unity in a divided world. Okay, so uh, today we're going to continue this series that we're calling United. And I am mindful of the fact that every time we do a series of messages or even a message itself, one of the things that's probably common is you're thinking, why this message? Why this series? You know, so why are we focused on unity in this series? And, you know, do Yancey and I have some secret rift in the background or... Uh, is there some group of navigators that has a beef with some other group of navigators in the church? Or um, You should know, that's not why. And to my knowledge, I don't know anything like that going on. I could be naive, but I don't know of anything like that going on. Uh, over the last 27 years, we have enjoyed this incredible amount of unity around here. But that's not to say that unity is not threatened. I think unity is threatened in churches all across America, in this church. Uh, it's threatened over the deep divisions in our culture about politics, about COVID-19, and what are the safety protocols that we're going to embrace or not embrace, about racial divides and how they're spoken about and handled, and many other things as well. So we're giving attention to unity in the midst of a culture that's divided. That's why we're doing this. So why is it that, why is it, that it matters so much? Let, let me show you a passage in the Bible. This is kind of the theme passage for this series, if you will. In uh, 1 Corinthians 1.10, it says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind, in the same judgment. The Apostle Paul's writing to a church, I'm going to talk about that church today, that is deeply divided and is calling them to be united. Why does it matter so much to God that people are united and why is division considered such a deep threat? Well, let me answer with a story. So when I went to college, uh, spent a number of years in the dorm, and then some guys, uh, we decided we we're going to get this apartment together. And we were all excited, had this common vision, it was going to be fun and everything, and we got into the apartment, and it didn't take long to figure out that, you know, after you eat, someone has to clean up. And we were all pretty domestically challenged, 
and selfish. And so we had these ideas we were going to cook and we'd share a meal together, but we would go weeks without washing dishes. I know. So as you can imagine, we had roaches everywhere. And in spite of the roaches, we, uh, we just would galvanize our position and say, no, dude, it's your turn to wash the dishes. It's not my turn. And what it ultimately led to was we stopped sharing meals together. Because when we'd share a meal together, we would argue over who's going to wash the dishes. Now, later I learned that there's this general principle in life that goes something like this. It says, if you, if you think everyone just has to do their part, you'll always have division. Everyone has to do more than their part in every relationship. And if that doesn't happen, it will digress into a kind of defensiveness and criticism and scorekeeping in the relationships. So we had this vision that was lost in the midst of division over, no joke, washing dishes. And what it ultimately ended up doing is it just ruined the whole experience. It didn't work. It just didn't work. Unity is a beautiful thing. The Bible speaks of it as this pleasant blessing kind of experience between people. Unity is this shared purpose where people assume the best of one another and they care and support one another and ultimately unity glorifies God. Let me say that differently because that sounds real religious. Unity is, it helps things be as they were intended to be. That's what it means to glorify God. It helps things be as they were intended to be. We can say it this way, unity works. It works in all of life and in all of relationships. And that's why it matters so much to God. And it should matter to us as well. Good news is, there's a passage in the Bible that addresses this specifically in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So if you have a Bible, you can turn there if you'd like or on your uh, phone or whatever. And let me give you a little background into 1 Corinthians 12. I'm going to bring up some verses on the screen as well. So the background is the apostle Paul had planted this church, started this church in a city called Corinth. It was a port city with a great deal of diversity, similar to Houston, quite frankly. And in this city, this church came together when people began to believe in Jesus, but they came from all these different pagan backgrounds, and the church was marked by division. And so he's addressing the issues of division all through 1 Corinthians, uh, the whole book. Like, some people were saying, you know, I am of Paul and I am of Apollos, and all these leaders in the church. And so they were, they were focused on personalities that they were following. Some of them... Uh, some of the division was really born around sexuality because people had different views of what was appropriate or inappropriate sexually. And instead of taking their cues from God, they just argued with each other about that. And there was social snobbery and selfishness at the Lord's Supper. I mean, literally, people would come together at this event that was supposed to celebrate what Jesus has done for us, and they would share a meal before that, but some of them would have filet mignon, and the others couldn't even afford ramen noodles. And there was no sharing. And so there's this sense that some are better because they have more. The specific passage that we're going to look at is focused on spiritual gifts and how some people saw themselves as superior to other people because of the gifts that they had. And so Paul wrote this letter to address this disunity in the culture that had made its way into the church. And his assumption is this, in Christ... There should be a shocking and attractive unity in the church, in all churches. And that's, that's almost laughable if you've been in a lot of churches because unity is kind of hard to come by. But what God makes possible is not automatic. In other words, even though God wants this for us and he makes it possible for us, we have to devote ourselves to it. And so that's what we're going to look at in 1 Corinthians 12, how unity works. And so 
in the long passage of 1 Corinthians 12 that we're going to consider, in the middle of that passage is really the key idea. And by the key idea, what I mean is when we get this, we're going to see it's tied to every other thing. So here's what it says, beginning in verse 12. For just as the body is one and has many members. He's talking about your physical body, right? You have hands, you have feet, you have eyes, ears. There are many members to your body, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body. So it is with Christ. So it is with God's people that we are one body in Christ, right? So one body, many members, but we're still one. He's emphasizing unity. And then he tells us how this unity comes about. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. And so he says to these people who came from different pagan backgrounds, he says, we have the same story. Our story is we came from somewhere, but we came to faith in Jesus Christ. So all these people have a story about where they came to understand Jesus died on the cross for sin, that his resurrection gives us hope. We believe in him. We don't earn our salvation. He gives it freely. That's our story. And so he says, when you came to believe, then you were immersed in the Spirit of God. When you get Jesus, you got the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's not a second blessing. It's one package deal. You get Jesus, you get the Holy Spirit, and you're immersed in the Spirit. He's in you. He's with you. He's all around you. He's at work among us. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. So what happens when the Holy Spirit comes, because unity is in his DNA, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, three in one, unity is in his DNA. And when you get the Holy Spirit, he is working toward, it is likely that you will experience unity if you're led by the Holy Spirit, even if, even if you come from very diverse groups. So we talked about, you know, Jews or Greeks, and Yancey spoke of how vastly different Jews were than Gentiles and how there was this great divide, but Jesus tore down the dividing wall and made these two vastly different groups into one. The same thing for slave or free. And you could take any two groups of people that are supposedly divided, and Jesus, because of his spirit, can make those people into one. And this is kind of the heart of the whole passage Because according to 1 Corinthians 12, we build unity. It's the work of the Spirit, really. But we work with the Spirit to build unity in the four things we have in common. I'm going to focus on the four things that we have in common. So here's how it starts out in verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, the big topic is unity, but the immediate topic is spiritual gifts. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I don't want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, before you became Christians, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. And therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. So the Corinthians were divided over spiritual gifts in the church Because a lot of them came from different kinds of cults where uh, the more ecstatic, the more kind of spectacular uh, the experience was in the church, the more spiritual it was considered. And so some of them thought they were superior to others. And so Paul's just saying, listen, it's not about how outlandish your gifting is. If you have the Holy Spirit and spiritual gifts, here's what they do. Those gifts point to Jesus Christ, to the lordship of Jesus Christ. So he gives this connection. There is a common confession for those who are a part of the Christian church, and that confession is that Jesus is Lord. And he says you can't say that apart from the Spirit. Not meaning you can't say the words. Anybody can say the words. He's saying you can't say that and mean it. Do you know what that means? I mean, when you say, Jesus is Lord. He's Lord over my life. I want to be that person 
who hears his word, and I obey him. I want to think like he wants me to think. I want to do what he wants me to do. I want to love like he wants me to love. Jesus is Lord. Why? Because Jesus is authority. He is the the supreme authority over all things. And to say that Jesus is Lord is to submit my life to his lordship. And when that happens, you imagine a whole room of people, a whole congregation of people who say, listen, the supreme allegiance in my life is to Jesus The supreme allegiance. Or you could think about a hierarchy of hope in your life. And we all have a hierarchy of hope. There are a number of things that we kind of have a hope in. But the the first thing I hope in, more than anything else, is Jesus. And that's a game changer when it comes to unity. So I'm driving down the road in, uh, in Cuba with some Cuban Christians in the car with me. And I'm, I'm just taken back by how connected I feel to these people. Because for them, Jesus is Lord. For me, Jesus is Lord. And I think, we don't agree politically. We don't have the same nationality. We don't, we don't have uh, even the same culture. We don't have the same socioeconomic status. I mean, we could go on and on about how many things we are unalike, and yet the thing that matters most is the thing that is alike, and that is that Jesus, who is Lord of each of us, is the Lord of all of us, and when that's the case, we should have this deep-seated unity when Jesus is Lord. Okay, when Jesus is Lord, the Spirit does something else to create unity among us. Uh, And we'll see that beginning in verse 4. It says, now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are varieties of service, but the same Lord, and there are varieties of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them all in everyone. Pause a moment. I underline these to help you see the Trinity here, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And what he's saying is that God is who is diverse but one, looks at us with the varieties of gifts and services and activities. I mean, some are involved in caring for children in children's ministry. And some are caring for those who just had pipes burst in their houses. And so they're in houses caring for those folks. And some are theologians who are hammering out the ideas that we teach around here. And yet, in all this variety, he says, there is one God who's empowering all. All of this. And then he says, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Now, that's the key verse. So let's look at verse 7. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To you. You're at each, right? So you have gifts given to you by God if you have faith in Jesus. It's just this supernatural kind of manifestation of God's work in your life, and it's in fitting with your personality, with your experiences, um, with your specific interests and passions. And so each of us have that. And it's given not to show how spiritual we are. Spiritual gifts are not mood rings. You know, they're not, remember mood rings, you know, kind of show people how you felt. So you don't have spiritual gifts to show people how spiritual you are. Spiritual gifts are given for the manifestation of the Spirit. The Spirit's invisible. But we can see him. We can see him manifested when people use their gifts. And it's like this awe-inspiring thing. This unity of people serving each other in powerfully unique ways. We could also say for the glory of God, the manifestation of spirits. Just another way of saying the glory of God, that God is seen and God is understood for who he is. But ultimately, all of that is for the common good. Listen, um, to understand how the use of your gifts and my gifts all bring a concert for the common good is a tech tonic shift 
in our understanding of unity. This idea of common good. We want to lead unchurched people to know Christ and to understand His grace. That is common good. And we want to see a community of young people come to faith and be strong and and whole. That's common good. And we want to see orphans cared for. And we want to see uh, people in this community well fed, even if they've had food insecurity. We could go on and on. I'm just saying, all of these things work together for the common good. And this common good is part of what we're building for the sake of unity as well. Now, most people, when we talk about this, they ask this question. It's been true uh, for the life of our church. They say, okay, uh, I'm in for the common good. How do I do that? How do I know what my spiritual gifts are? And if we had time, we could read the next section of the passage, and it's going to list some of the gifts, but not all of the spiritual gifts. But that doesn't automatically engage us in serving, right? Just because you might know what your gifts are. So on Clear Creek Resources, you can go there. There's an article there called uh, Gifts of the Spirit that you'll easily find. And it's just going to talk about the different spiritual gifts and then give you an opportunity to take a survey that will help indicate what your spiritual gifts are. But that's not the best way to know that. That's not the best way. The best way is when we just serve with people. Because when you serve with people... What happens over time is uh, they begin to tell you what you're good at. Just like they can see in you what you can't see, and you can see in them what, what they don't see. And that's why we do you know, Serve Link. And serve Link is just an opportunity to serve in a ministry area. And you know, if it's not a fit for you, you don't have to go back. It's just you know, no strings attached. But in this way, we are, we are learning to lean into the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Funny thing is, some of our gifts are really highly visible. You know, like like right now, all the lights are on me. Most of you, not all of you, are looking at me. And I have a microphone. Highly visible in the exercise of my spiritual gifts. There are some of you that think... If you had to put me up there, that would be H-E double hockey sticks to me, right? I mean, that's the last thing in the world you'd ever want to do is be up in front of everybody. But you have gifts that are behind the scenes gifts. But what, what we can never do is see gifts that are up front gifts as higher or superior or more important than the other gifts. And the apostle warns us that this is a tendency that we might have. And if we give in to that tendency, then it could undermine unity in the church. So that's what he talks about next. He says, we build unity for th- through number three, a common dependence. A common dependence. So let's look at what the passage says about a common dependence. It says, verse 14, for the body does not consist of one member, so he's talking about the body again, but many members, and if the foot should say, so get what he's saying, he's acting as if you know, body parts can talk, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body the body. So it's this hilarious picture of body parts. You know, they're talking about other body parts. He's trying to get into the mind of everyone who would use his or her gifts. And what he's helping us understand is that you cannot compare your gifts to someone else's gifts without it spoiling the joy of it and making you feel useless. Comparing just makes us feel useless and joyless. So he says, don't compare. That's really all he's saying. Don't think less of yourself because of your gifts. It's silly to think that your gifts don't matter. If you're a foot, now we can take a stand. If you're an ear, now someone can actually listen to someone. What a gift. Think about that. 
You've had a moment where someone listened to you and it made all the difference in the world. So he's celebrating the uniqueness of each of these gifts. And not only does he warn us not to think too little of ourselves, he warns us not to think too much of ourselves as well because he's going to picture body parts talking trash to each other. He says, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. In brief, he's just saying we need each other. And the big game changer when it comes to unity is when we are served by others who are different than us and then we serve people who are different than us. And we understand the beauty of needing each other. That is powerful in unity. So, I need our arts team. They stand up here and they sing. They play instruments beautifully. And I got to tell you, sometimes I think, it's in my head, I think, Psst, I want to do that. But let me promise you, you don't want me to do that. <laughs> right? I mean, I think nobody would be worshiping God if I was doing that. You'd be begging for relief. I need them. There's a group in our church, our finance team, and they're just a group of people. They have all this you know, financial background, and they're really good with uh, finances, and they're, they watch over how we use money. And we need them. They help us to have trust that when we give, that what we give is going to be used appropriately. And they're appropriate walls of separation, right, between those who are just spending money and those who are watching over and making sure we're using resources as we should. And you don't see any of those people, but we need them. I need people who, um, who show mercy. You know, people who have mercy gifts. When someone's suffering, there are people who move away from those who are suffering because suffering just makes them so uncomfortable to be around someone suffering. Are you like that? You probably don't have mercy gifts if you are. But there are some people, they move toward people who are suffering. They, they want to be next to them. They want to, to comfort them. And if you've ever suffered and all of a sudden the mercy gifts begin to show up in your life in the forms of people who are caring for you, it is a game changer. And all of a sudden you think, I need people. I've lived so much of my life with so much pride thinking I didn't really need anybody. It's truth. But the, the more I've lived, the more I realize I need people. That's how the body works. We serve each other. We need each other. And when we know these things, instead of self-depreciation or self-importance, we suffer when someone else suffers and we rejoice when someone else is honored. That's what he says next. Notice. He says, but God has so composed the body. So he uses the metaphor of the body. He's talking about the church. Composed the church. Giving greater honor to the part that lacked it. That there may be no division in the body. That's what he's talking about. That there may be no division in the body. But that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. So what does it look like when there's no division in the body? Ultimately, it looks like this. That the members may have the same care for one another. This is the great blessing of real unity in a community of people. We have a common care. On February the 4th, we lost one of our own. Larry Thomas passed away after a, a long fight with cancer. He and his wife, Laurie, have uh, served in numerous ways in the life of this church for years. They've served a lot of people. 
in, in small groups, hosted small groups in their home. And uh, recently, Laurie reminded me of the first season of that fight. Because when Larry first found he, out he had cancer, um, the cancer had destroyed one of the vertebrae in his back, and he had to have a surgery. And a lot of people came around them to help, help even arrange the right people to see that surgery happen. But their small group showed up. See, because when we suffer, we suffer together. And the group showed up and just prayed for them regularly. Matter of fact, uh, I love this. They created a prayer blanket. This is what that looked like. So uh, Laurie's daughter opened her house. They, the group came in and they drew their hands on this blanket and wrote scriptures on the blanket so that when he's taking treatment, they could, you know, in a sense, they'd be laying hands on him as they're praying for him. This prayer blanket would cover him when he was cold as a reminder to him. Of course, they provided meals for them. And, uh, and Laurie said, you know, on the really, really hard days, if people are praying for you, you can feel it. You know it. That people are praying for you. I wish that everyone who came to Clear Creek Community Church knew deep down in your gut what that feels like, what that, that experience is. Not, not the cancer part, you know. I'm talking about being cared for when you suffer. The truth is, not everybody knows that. Because you have to really be known to be connected for that kind of, of care to happen. It's like, it, it's really the, the crowning piece of unity because we have this common faith in Jesus and we want to be on his mission doing the good work of the gospel, but we're learning how to depend on each other, to be in relationship with each other. And ultimately, because of our common faith and our life together, we have this amazingly common care for one another. That's how unity really works. Years ago, I was uh, at an ecumenical meeting in the city. So that means there were people there from all different kinds of faith. And we were talking about uh, how to care for the poor and how to feed the um, homeless people in our city. And at the end of the meeting, the rabbi who stood to lead the prayer gave the prayer I'm about to, to share with you. Um, Rabbi said, a vision of hell was people around the table. And on the table is a big bowl of stew. And the people do not have arms, but in place of arms they have spoons. But the spoons do not bend at the elbow. So the people can dish into the bowl of stew, but they cannot feed themselves. The food is so close, but their appetite is never satisfied. And a vision of heaven was people around the table. On the table was a big bowl of stew, and the people did not have arms, but in place of arms, they have spoons. But the spoons did not bend at the elbow. But in heaven, when the people dip their spoons into the dish, they feed one another across the table. That's how unity works. Unity is it's like the magic. I mean, it's the mojo. It's that intangible thing that makes all the difference. It is the work of the Spirit. It is this beautiful community that reflects the glory of God. Things are as they should be. It's how it works. Would you bow with me? Let's pray together. Father in heaven, I pray that we might experience the kind of unity that you want for each of us and for all of us. A kind of unity that, that the Old Testament speaks of when it is good and pleasant and a blessing. It's the kind of unity where we know we have a part
to play. And we depend on others as well. And a kind of unity where we, we so feel connected because of our relationship with you that we care for one another like brothers and sisters. Father, I pray for those who haven't felt that unity or even now feel really division. Maybe division in a home or in a friendship or division even in this church. And I pray that you would restore us. I pray that you would remind us that it is in Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit that this kind of unity is even made possible so that we, all of us, run to Jesus Jesus, our Savior, Jesus, our hope, Jesus, the lover of our soul, and depend upon the Holy Spirit to do this work, and we cooperate with enthusiasm as you make us one body, functioning as the hands and feet of Jesus for your glory. And I ask this of you in Jesus' name, amen. Well, Bruce challenged us to honor those who serve the body. And in our services, we're publicly celebrating those who serve in roles behind the scenes. People you might not see when you walk into a church, but without them, we wouldn't have church in the same way. One of those people is Scott Kiefer. Scott's been serving at Clear Creek for almost 20 years. Think about that, 20 years. Started in media and now having directed video for the past decade. His dedication and work helps to bring this online experience into our homes each week. We're so grateful for him. And then there's Mike Clark. Mike's worked for many years in video and television production and has served at Clear Creek for over 13 years as camera operator. His willingness to use his experience and gifts also provides us the opportunity to gather online for our worship experience each week. Couldn't do it without him. And then our small groups ministry. We have a team of people, Allison Swinson, Stacy White, Carson Jones, all those folks are working with us and they're doing this as they volunteer from home and considering the best ways to start new small groups in person and online and to keep people connected, to train our leaders and to encourage them. So let's honor people in our church like that. And let's do it this week. So if you know someone who serves at Clear Creek in some way, encourage them. But I also want to challenge you to play your role in the body to contribute to the unity of the church in the way that you use your gifts. So go to clearcreek.org and click on the serve button and explore what it might look like for you to engage in a serving role, whether that's in person, from home, or online. And look, this isn't a lifetime commitment. It's just the chance to explore ministry areas and opportunities that might be a good fit for you. So this week, remember, Let's honor someone you know that's serving in the body and then find a way to contribute to the unity in the church by using your gifts to serve in some way. God bless you guys and thanks for being here with us.